This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Cora, for the introduction and for the opportunity to come back to Cornell. I was here, I guess, about 12 years ago, and I had uh, quite an experience, as some of you um, know. Uh, I went to a frat party while I was here as an invited speaker, and uh, we didn't go last night, so I'm, but they're still tonight. I'm not going home until tomorrow morning. Um, and uh, yeah, what else did I want to say? I, yeah, just a couple of things. So yeah, if you want to ask questions, I think two good questions maybe that I won't get into um, right now, but good questions to ask are, how did you get into this? There's always a story. I don't look for trouble, but trouble finds me all the time. Um, uh, how did you get into this? And then secondly, you know, what's it like being an entrepreneur? Um, and I will say that I did get into science to try to avoid entrepreneurs and, and business people and, and especially lawyers, but it's not really working out very well. Um, and I can tell you all kinds of stories as to why. All right, so let's, uh, so this, uh, is, this actually could have been a picture from our dinner last night, kind of. But um, it's actually a painting of Friedrich Serturner, who was uh, a pharmacist's apprentice. And back in the early 1800s, in 1804, 1806, he was the first to isolate a natural product from a plant. And it was morphine from, from opium poppy. I'm not sure exactly what he's doing here. It's kind of a strange way of going drinking with your buddies. Um, and he's definitely caused some problems for them over here, but we'll get, we'll get back to that um, in, in just a moment. Uh, I'm gonna start with acknowledgements because I always leave it to the end and then I run out of time and, and I don't feel like I give enough credit to the people that are in the lab presently uh, and certainly those that have um, been in my lab uh, previously. I think, I think it sounds like you met at least one of them recently. Uh, so I'm going to start with the, the company. So we have um, this startup that uh, Gaurav was, was referring to. It's called Epimeron Incorporated. It's in the process of expanding and, and uh, hopefully bigger things are happening. Some very high caliber scientists. It's great working with, uh, with very senior people because I just sort of say, do this. We need to do this. And then they go and, and they do it. I still have a, a small academic uh, lab with a couple of postdocs and, and two um, two PhD students and then, and then some collaborators and uh, get lots of funding or over the years, lots of funding from especially Canadian government, uh, federal sources, and more recently having the company has provided a, a good means of um, uh, combining sort of uh, industrial applications and translation of research with uh, continued and, and continued academic quests and, and being able to support a lot of those quests um, so I just wanted to say a little bit more about, about the company. I, I do enjoy being part of you know, the entrepreneurial um, experience. Uh, so we started this company in, in 2014. And again, you know, I think I'd be happy to share with you experiences as to why. I wasn't quite happy with the trans, translational capabilities at the University of Calgary. They mean well, but they don't have the capital to, to really move um, a lot of these technologies from the state that they're at to something uh, that's gonna be uh, um, of interest to, to uh, bigger uh, multinational, especially pharmaceutical companies out there. So we started, decided to try to do it ourselves. Um, and we currently have eight full-time staff members. And our business model so far has not been, so our intention is not actually to produce opiates in uh, yeast fermentation, but it's to do this, and that's to basically uh, use our knowledge of the system and find the new parts, understand the processes, and then uh, move those discoveries and intellectual property to uh, intermediate and, and larger partners that are able to take it ultimately to, to market. Uh, so we, we generate a lot of IP, a lot of patents, and, and we license those patents. And one of our, our biggest partners so far has been in Trexon, which is found in a few locations across the US. So we collaborated with um, uh, one of their, their units that's in San Francisco. All right, so, so I'll get, get to uh, 
the star of the show, which is opium poppy. So, you know, opium poppy is um, a, an ancient medicinal plant. It's been cultivated, uh, domesticated by uh, uh, a number of, of uh, civilizations uh, around the world for about the last six or 7,000 years. And in spite of its age and how long that we've been connected, uh, we've been connected to it, it's still our only source for all of the compounds that you see on this slide. Uh, so morphine and codeine are natural compounds in the plant. Noscopene and papaverine are also, they also have pharmaceutical applications. Um, as a cough suppressant, papaverine is a vasodilator. Uh, and uh, noscopene is also being investigated for potential anti-cancer properties. It hasn't made it past phase two clinical trials yet. Um, but also very importantly are these semi-synthetic compounds, oxycodone, hydrocodone, and especially these days, you, see, you hear a lot about naloxone as an, an, uh, an antagonist. Um, so it's used, it's very effective uh, at uh, treating uh, overdose. So there's, you can go to pharmacies. I don't know what the situation is like in the US, but in, in Canada, you can go to a pharmacy and they'll give you a naloxone kit, basically, with a surret in it. So if somebody's um, overdosing from fentanyl or whatever uh, on, on the, you know, on the, the subway, you can have that and, and you can save their lives in, in many cases by having this available. So these compounds are semi-synthetic. The backbone comes from the plant, and, and I'll tell you more about that shortly, but then they are um, modified uh, uh, through, through some chemical processes to get these additional functional groups um, on there. All right, so, so again, I like to start with, I like to connect with with um, these plants in the sense of you know, why they're important to humanity. And this is a plant that we've had a long relationship is in, with as, as humans. Um, and you can see that evidence in archeological discoveries, especially all through um, Europe and, and the Middle East. So these are locations where there's been some sort of opium poppy artifact that often goes back to the Bronze Age. You know, so, so three, 4,000 years BC, you find these poppy capsules in, in various artifacts. Um, this uh, Cave of the Bats here in, in Spain is one of the prime locations where you find these, these materials. And I was talking last night about how interested I am one day when I'm you know, wealthy enough, not now, but um, to, uh, to get my hands on some of this material and, and do some ancient DNA sequencing and see what those see what those poppy varieties were like and try to trace, you know, how did this plant get around? How did, how did people move it around uh, and connect that anthropologically with, with the history, with our history as, you know, as, as humans? Um, ancient empires are all connected with, with opium poppy. So there's a bunch of them listed here and you can see it again in archeological artifacts. So opium poppy on these um, Roman coins or, or Greek coins, this is a, a Cretan uh, poppy goddess, um, you know, and you often see again on these reliefs the depictions of, of opium poppy uh, being associated with ancient civilizations. What's interesting is that in Europe, even though opium poppy goes back many thousands of years, the uh, knowledge of the plant and the, the medicinal compounds in Europe, at least, was lost from about the fall of the Roman Empire until the Renaissance. So nobody, nobody used it or had it anymore in Europe. It was brought back. Um, knowledge was actually maintained um, in, in uh, other parts of the world, so in the Arab world or um, in, in Persia, and uh, brought back to Europe. And it was brought back by this fellow over here, um, and, and his name is Paracelsus. So Paracelsus was an interesting person, a Renaissance botanist, alchemist, physician, astrologer and occultist. I'd, I'd like to put that on my business card. It would be an, an, you know, an interesting job description. So he was traveling in Arabia and he brought back a sword. If it's on a magic card or whatever, you know it's important. Um, so you know, he brought back a, a sword and in the, um, in the hilt of the sword, there were, there were these uh, crystals that, were, that he called the stones of immortality. So it was opium, citrus, citrus juice, and gold basically mixed together in some nuggets. And you know, from that point, it, it became, again, part of um, sort of European uh, medical culture in, during the Renaissance. And things really got interesting in the 1800s. 
So, so in the 1800s, um, opium started to be used much more extensively. It was actually um, a very dangerous time, apparently, to be a, a child during, during that, that, uh, that uh, part of uh, time in history. So you can see that from some of these ads over here. Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup for children teething. Uh, you know, uh, cough killer. It works like magic. Um, so as someone that has had children, I think those of you that also do would probably agree with me that it's unfortunate that this, these products are no longer available. Because um, I, I can imagine they were, they were quite effective at kind of keeping kids quiet. Um, it was also, uh, uh, you know, opiates were actually a very big part of the American Civil War. So there was an awful lot of addiction because all soldiers were given a, um, uh, a syringe and an opium for their, their battle, battlefield uh, wounds. And, and again, it, it, uh, you know, to have these kind of connections or understanding of a plant that has such an ancient origin and how it's connected to so much of our history makes you know, the uh, trials and tribulations of pipetting in a lab a lot more enjoyable when you, you know that you're contributing to that. To that history. So it continues to be a plant that is a, a dual use technology. So you can use it for both good and, and bad purposes. But most of our technologies are like that, right? Nuclear, uh, nuclear power, nuclear energy is a, a, a good example of that. You can generate electricity or you can do the wrong things with, with, uh, with that, that same technology. So, so here's, the, here's the dark side of opium poppy. Um, so if you forget everything else from this talk, you'll remember this. And, and that's what happens when you take morphine that's extracted from uh, the plant and you mix it together with an acetyl donor. So you can buy some acetic anhydride that is actually quite difficult to buy because you can do this with it. You can make morphine diacetate pretty, pretty easily. And morphine diacetate, of course, is heroin. And then you can see the difference. All that's happening is that the morphine is being diacetylated at the, those two hydroxyl functions. And it was back in the early part of the 20th century that, that uh, heroin was used extensively as a cough suppressant. So there's some ads from some old, um, some old uh, uh, products. The problem of cough has been solved by, by heroin. And certainly it's very effective, just like codeine is effective as a cough, cough uh, medicine. It was believed that this product, heroin, was non-addictive, and certainly that wasn't true. So within you know, some few years of it being put on the market, there were half a million opium addicts or heroin addicts in the U.S., and then in the 1920s, it was taken um, off the market as a, as a cough suppressant. But of course, it remains as, as a problem in the world, and, and this kind of demonstrates um, the, the problem. The, pr the problem is you can make money from, from producing heroin. So you can, you, know, you can grow opium poppy in Afghanistan, and then you can transport the opium to other countries like Turkey and add value to it with some degree of processing. And then by the time you get it to, to Europe on the streets as heroin, heroin, you've added a lot of value to, to the product. Um, and just gives you some idea of you know, where the problems are particularly bad um, in, in Europe, in Russia, and other parts parts of the world, not, not really so much in North America. In Canada, it's Vancouver that has the biggest problem with, with opiates um, and, and heroin addiction. And other, other places, what I hear is Calgary is too cold, so nobody wants to kind of live on the streets in Calgary. It's probably a bad idea, actually, in the, in the winter. Um, so this is my map of um, what I call the good guys and the bad guys sort of thing. So, so the good guys are, are in green. and and it's not really quite accurate, but the, the problems in the world are, are in red. Um, the biggest problem, of course, is Afghanistan for illicit production of, of opium poppy. Uh, Mexico and Colombia are counting now for maybe about 5% of the total illicit production. The Golden Triangle over here used to be more of a problem, a lot less so recently. Um, but what's interesting is all these countries in green that are actually licit producers, licit growers of opium poppy. Australia is number one. Uh, maybe I'm being a little bit unfair to um, the Australians by suggesting that their entire continent is a haven for growing opium poppy. It's actually restricted just to the island of Tasmania. But they account for about 50% of the global licit production right now. Um, but also other countries, India, Turkey, and even France, in, in particular in Europe, 
account for a, a substantial, France is about 10% of illicit production. And it's done in very modern ways. Okay? So it's, it's, uh, here's a poppy field in Tasmania uh, using modern farming equipment. The plants have to, uh, as, as required by the United Nations, they have to be allowed to dry in the field. And then the, the, the harvester comes along, basically cuts them off with about 10 centimeters of stem, and then takes that material, crushes it, and extracts the, the pharmaceutical products of, of interest. Um, the traditional way of collecting opium poppy, of course, is to lance the unripe seed capsules, and this latex will exude, and the latex, once it dries and oxidizes, becomes uh, raw opium. So the content of morphine at this stage is maybe 1% or under 1% of the, of the liquid, but when it oxidizes and dries and becomes this loaf of raw opium, it, it will rise to about 15% of the, of the weight. Right? So it's a lot easier to ship this material illicitly uh, around uh, as opposed to all of this biomass. And that's the reason the UN only allows India, in fact, to continue um, in an in illicit manner to do it this way because it's, it's considered to be um, uh, historical or, or traditional. So this guy over here is interesting to me because he's, uh, he's doing his job and you can see without uh, the use of gloves. So I'm sure that his job satisfaction rating is higher than mine ever will be. That doesn't say much though on many days. Um, so, so again, connecting to the scientific history of everything you're going to hear today. So I think, you know, I think one of the things that I try to impress on students is, is that you know, what we know, what's in the textbook, or what, what you read in the literature, and, and we uh, discuss as now the dogma in the field, somebody had to get us to that point. Many people get us to that point. And it's a very long and slow process. So this is a timeline of, um, of morphine, for morphine, 200 years, more than 200 years of scientific history from uh, Sarah Turner and his first isolation of morphine uh, to 30, 25 years later, the isolation of, of codeine by this, this French uh, chemist. Heroin was first synthesized in 1874. Um, the structure of morphine was not determined until 1925. You know, almost 125 years later, after the compound was isolated, the structure was identified. And it was, it was identified by this fellow here, um, Sir Robert Robertson, who's a Nobel Prize winner, and also knighted, um, as is his, uh, this, this fellow is still alive, Alan Battersby, brought the biochemistry forward. Um, they're, both, um, they're both sirs. Um, even though Canada is still part of the Commonwealth, I'm not allowed to become a sir, because I'm not a British um, subject. So I didn't put my picture over here. I just put a bit of the pathway, right? maybe, maybe later. Um, uh, so yeah, lots of, lots of, uh, 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 lots of interesting and, and important discoveries, but a very long period of time. And this is the period of time that we're operating in, in about the last quarter of a century. Okay, so, uh, so I wanna um, show you now how a plant, how opium poppy, the only plant that, that can really do it, how it can make morphine from tyrosine. So, so this elegance is really impressive. How do you take a simple amino acid, uh, two copies of it, and, and make this molecule that chemists can make, but they really can't yet make it at yields that are um, economically competitive with using the plant as a source of these compounds. So let's, let's just start off then with tyrosine. And, and the way I like to show this, I don't like to show slides that have lots of structures all over the place. Um, I, I actually came up with this some years ago. I was stuck in the airport in Boston overnight, and I didn't know what to do. They shut everything down, so I, I, I basically drew structures. What else does a biochemist do when you're bored? Um, I think this is an effective way of showing it. So there's tyrosine. The first thing that happens is it's decarboxylated, and then it's three hydroxylated. So you end up with dopamine. That's important neurotransmitter in us but it's also a precursor to morphine and opium poppy. There's another molecule of tyrosine, and this time going down um, this route over here, you deaminate it, and then you decarboxylate it, and you end up with the second intermediate that combines with tyrosine or with dopamine to make the first so-called benzyl isoquinoline alkaloid, and this is 4-hydroxyphenylacetaldehyde. Okay, so there they are again, dopamine and 4-hydroxyphenylacetaldehyde, or 4-HPAA, 
and you get a pictet spangler condensation reaction catalyzed by this enzyme narcocorine synthase, and there you go. Now you have a benzyl isoquinoline alkaloid. It's benzyl isoquinoline because there's the benzyl and there's the isoquinoline moiety, and that's, it's as simple as that. It doesn't retain that structural form. The, the backbone structure changes, and so too does the decoration. So any, every time you change the backbone structure of, of one of these benzyl isoquinoline alkaloids, you have a whole new molecule that you can decorate with different functionalities and change its, the, the pharmacological properties, biological properties, and so on of the molecule. So let's start off with this norcochrane over here. So it's, it's six O-methylated and then N-methylated, three prime hydroxylated, and then four prime O-methylated. That's these reactions over here. And you end up with this key intermediate called S-reticulane. We were talking this morning at, at breakfast about chirality. So it's, an, it's in the S, it's the S conformer of reticulane. And what's interesting is that that wasn't good enough apparently for opium poppy. It, it, it wouldn't, it is unable to drive it forward to morphine as the S conformer. It has to change to the R conformer. It has to change its right hand to its left hand something like that, maybe the left hand or the right hand. Um, and, and this is what happens next. Okay, so, so there's, um, there's S-reticulene, and how do, you, how do you change the chirality of a, a chiral center? So you can remove it by oxidizing it, and then you can put it back by reducing it. And it's just the specificity of these, of these two enzymes, which interestingly have fused together into a single enzyme that we call reticulene epimerase, and it simply changes the handedness of, of the intermediate. So let's look at reticulin. That, those are actually the same two compounds over there, just changing the, the perspective of how we're looking at it. It's easier to look at it this way because the next step in the process is to change the structure, the backbone structure, and that's done by this enzyme here, salutaridine synthase. There's salutaridine, a carbon-carbon coupling, and you have now a four-membered ring, and you can start to decorate it again. So it's, um, it is reduced to, from the keto to the, to the alcohol, and then the, um, the, the hydroxyl group is acetylated, and then that allylic group falls off, and you end up with thebane. Now you have your pentacyclic backbone. And from there, you have now another somewhat different um, backbone structure, and you can continue to change the functionalities. So it's 6 od methylated, reduced, 3 od methylated, and now you have morphine. Right? Very elegant process. Every one of those steps catalyzed by a different enzyme, and now you know, every one of those genes encoding those enzymes is available to do something with, to study, and so on. Okay, so um, what I want to talk to you mostly about today, pick these topics because I think they're, um, they're kind of demonstrating or they're representative of, of where a lot of activity is in this space, and that's bioengineering in um, microbial systems. So, so there's been a lot of um, interest, let's say, some hype certainly as well, of moving those pathways out of the plant into a microbial, potentially fermentable system, fermentation system, to displace the plant as a source of these products. And interestingly, the first question that was asked was not, can we do that? Instead, the first question that I think was asked in uh, about 2015 was, should we be doing that? Is that, is that something we should be doing? And you saw um, articles appearing. This was in Nature. I question Nature. I, I question Nature. I don't know if this is something that would be referred to you know, in the US these days as fake news. But um, it's, it's interesting to kind of put that spin on it, right? regulate home-brewed opiates, right? You really want to start, didn't we go through all of this with um, GMOs and tr plant transformation and so on? And now before the technology really gets out of the door, uh, there's already, um, you know, sort of a negative spin that's, that's put on it. So I'm not going to worry about that. Again, it's something that, you know, can be discussed. Is it dangerous? Is it the right thing to do? I'm going to just talk about science and, and, and show you what, um, some of the problems are, what some of the good things actually about putting these pathways together in a, in a heterologous system is that you first of all learn why it doesn't work very well. And then you have a new system that you can ask new questions about and say, what can we discover 
to try to learn more about just academically um, what we don't know about how these, these pathways actually function, despite the fact that we have all the quote unquote genes that are, that are involved in the pathway. So the, the first place I'm going to start is from um, the group of Christina Smolke at, at Stanford, and they published a paper in Science in 2015 where they assembled the, the entire pathway. And indeed, they were actually able to produce um, this uh, the semi-synthetic hydrocodone de novo from a cheap carbon source, from sugar, basically. It was a, a very uh, substantial achievement, but the yields are telling you a story. It's telling, telling us that we still don't know um, certainly everything, maybe, maybe not as much as we need to, about how these pathways function. So what they got were these levels of thebane and, and hydrocodone. So, so sub-microgram per liter of hydrocodone, what do you need for commercial feasibility to make this fermentation process competitive with the plant, with cultivating the plant, you need above five grams per liter. So this is more than one million times too low. So I'd like to show this diagram um, as a way of reinforcing the, the problem of scale. Size does matter, right? So uh, here's a cell and here's a giant sequoia or um, a sperm whale. There is about a little less than, than 10 to the sixth difference in size. So we have to find a way of increasing the yield in these engineered yeast systems by a million times. That's a substantial difference in, in, in amount, for sure, or size. All right, so the first story I'm going to tell is um, the discovery of a new enzyme that, that was maybe suspected but not really sure, and call it thebane synthase. So this was published just a few months ago, earlier this year. Um, there were a number of authors, many of them came from Intrexon uh, that we're partnered with. Um, the people in uh, the company in my group that are particularly instrumental in making the discovery are Shui and, and Jill. Um, and what we noted, so where this kind of started, was that this is the pathway that I showed you over here. So there's salutaridine, reduced to salutaridinol, acetylated to 7-O-acetate, and then it was believed that the removal of that oacetate, that allylic elimina elimination, is spontaneous. And certainly it is. But in Trexon, when we were working with them, kept referring to carbon loss. The amount of carbon that was getting to this point was much more than the amount of carbon that was going past it. Well, carbon just doesn't disappear. Where was it going? So um, it was Jill that was looking at this. And we eventually discovered that there was a byproduct or set of byproducts that was being made, right? So this, this um, acetyltransferase, so we talked about acetyltransferases a lot today. So this acetyltransferase is not going to do what we want it to do unless it has help. And, that, and, and that's because when um, this compound, once that acetyl group is, is added to that hydroxyl there, this allylic elimination is going to happen spontaneously, but the main products by far are going to be these guys over here. And what happens is that um, water will come along and, and you'll have the oxidation of one of these points over here. So we're not exactly sure which one. We think it's actually this one, but it could potentially be these other ones as well. Right? These byproducts don't accumulate in the plant. We don't see them in the plant. So we, we surmise that this is not actually a spontaneous reaction that there's something that's preventing this from happening and instead promoting the um, allylic elimination whereby this hydroxyl, rather than from water, is attacking this carbon over here and you get thebane. Right? So that, that was a, um, a, you know, a, a deduction, I guess, continuing to look at systems and not accepting the literature as the truth, but simply as, as a guide. It's certainly incomplete. And in fact, what we ended up finding was it is an enzyme. There's an enzyme that we call thebane synthase. And the way that we found it was to take latex, and we assumed that it was going to be in the latex because as uh, these last steps over here, I haven't, haven't told you that, but these last steps in the pathway, um, especially beyond thebane to morphine, are all taking place in that latex. Whereas other steps in the pathway, the earlier steps are happening in adjacent cell types. So we won't won't get into that too much today, 
Um, but we decided to look in the latex, and when we took protein extracts from latex and set up a coupled enzyme assay, where we added sal AT, either plus or minus latex protein, and looked for what we made. If there was no latex protein, we primarily made what appears to be a collection of these um, mass to charge 330, we just call it a 330 byproduct. We, we make mostly that, but when we add in the latex protein, we make mostly thebane. So we said there's an enzyme in the latex that is catalyzing that step. It's not spontaneous. So we set about to purify it. You go to the literature, what does the literature tell us? So the literature is telling us that somebody's seen it before, right? It's very hard to do something that you can say, I thought of this myself. We, we didn't. It was actually seen by Minard Zank and reported a couple of times in the 90s and in the, the, the mid-2000s. Mid and it was saying, look, I, we see something as well. They, they kind of got the byproduct wrong. They called it this azanine derivative, which is this thing over here. We never see that. Uh, that part of it, I think, is, is incorrect, but still, the fact that there was something in here that was coordinating the formation of Thebane as opposed to a byproduct was, was seen or suspected um, previously. Oops. So we set about to, to purify it from the latex, and that was done through um, a set of, um, uh, or, or through using uh, some classic chromatography, protein chromatography steps. Uh, you know, so, it, so it's ammonium sulfate uh, pre precipitation, and then um, uh, hydrophobic interaction, ion exchange, and then this final, final one over here was, um, was uh, gel filtration chromatography. And the, the great thing now about protein purification is in the old days, you had to actually bring the protein to purity before you could subject it to amino acid sequencing. But now you can take each one of these fractions and send it for $200 for mass spec analysis and you'll get back all your proteins that are in that sample. You realize how impure everything really is when, when you uh, look at things using mass spec. So we were able with just those three purification steps to reduce the candidate list to just five proteins. And those five proteins were then and, and as you can see, they were, all, they were all fairly related. They were low molecular weight, so only uh, about 15 kilodaltons, fairly small. And we expressed all of them in E. coli. And of the six that we tested, the first one here that annotated as BETV1, it stands for Betula vulgaris. So it's a, a type of um, so-called PR10 pathogenesis-related protein that was first characterized in birch, in white birch. Um, and this guy, the heterologous protein was doing the same thing that the latex was. It was preventing the formation of the byproducts and instead coordinating the formation of thebane. The other ones weren't doing that. So there you go, we had thebane synthase. In parallel, um, you, you might have seen, some of you might have seen that the opium poppy genome was reported from Ian Graham's group uh, just uh, recently in the last couple of months. And uh, we've done the genome ourselves as well. We have a paper that that's, uh, should be published uh, hopefully sometime early next year. Um, on, on our version of the genome, they're, they're pretty similar, actually. But one of the things that we detected in parallel doing the biochemistry was that there's, there's a cluster of um, enzymes. And if you remember the biosynthesis, the REPI, the, uh, the reticulina epimerase, and then the subsequent one, two steps, cell, um, uh, salutaridine reductase and salutaridine acetyltransferase are clustered in the opium poppy genome. And you can see the distance is, they're not that far away, considering the genome is about 2.7 gigabase in size. They're pretty close. And we also saw thebane synthase there as well. We didn't know at the time that it was, but these things, these two approaches converged at almost the same time and, and gave us two parallel streams of evidence um, for, or, and, and, and paths to discovery. So I actually recommend both, right? If you're, if you're after things, especially when you get into the realm of, I don't even know what we're looking for. So what we try to, try to take is a very um, multifaceted approach, everything from genomes to classic biochemistry and, and everything in between.
All right, so um, there's two genes for thebane synthase that we see in the genome, thebane synthase one and two. Uh, there's actually four proteins. So one of the genes, thebane synthase one, has a secretion signal on it or a signal peptide. The other one doesn't. We, we think that the first one is located outside of the latex, and the second one, the thebane synthase two, is soluble inside the latex. So I still don't know exactly what's going on at the cellular level, but there's, there's obviously a lot to, to investigate. But then, in addition to that, there is a cryptic um, start codon, and we have evidence both from transcript size as well as by doing um, some additional proteomics analysis that there is a truncated form that, that seems to predominate in the latex of um, both thebane synthase 1 and 2, and those truncated forms and terminally truncated forms are inactive. Still a lot to understand, but um, uh, clearly I, I suspect that there's a role for all of these things. Another system that we use extensively and, and has um, worked out quite well with opium poppy is a functional genomics method that is, that is based on post-transcriptional gene silencing. So it's virus-induced gene silencing. It's very easy to do. So we simply build a construct. We um, infiltrate a young seedling into the apical meristem at about two weeks. And by the time the plants are six weeks old, we harvest them and, and, and test them. And what you can see here is that the uh, knockdown of, of Thebane synthase transcript levels is leading to a predicted decrease in Thebane ac accumulation and an increase in salutaridinol levels, which is a, a, an upstream, shortly upstream precursor um, of Thebane synthase in the pathway. Interestingly, we don't see a change in morphine levels. So morphine, as the end, end of these uh, pathways, seems to be like a sink. It's just things eventually drain down there. And when you're looking at a suppression technique like this, you don't necessarily see a difference in the accumulation of these major end products, but you can see supporting differences in the accumulation of pathway intermediates that, that give you some physiological evidence that your, your genes um, are correct. They're actually functioning in the plant the, the way that, that you see. So this is, this is what was done there. We silenced this. We see salutaridinol going up, and we see thebane going down. And that, that was, um, a, I think, a good piece of evidence in support of, of the role of thebane synthase in the pathway. Then uh, in the context of yeast engineering, so how does this help with the low titer of uh, opiate production in yeast? So, so again, this was done in collaboration with Intrexon. Uh, so putting the pathway together and, and either not having or adding thebane synthase, or the last one over here is having everything integrated in the genome of yeast, but also adding extra copies of thebane synthase uh, transi transiently expressed off of plasmid. And you can see that you get a substantial increase in the yield of thebane compared to a strain that is lacking the thebane synthase. It's just in this first experiment, it was about a 25-fold improvement. So already we've gone up you know, an order of magnitude in, in uh, yield in a, a very much not optimized system. These are, the, these are the tools that are gonna be needed to make these technologies work, and there's more of these tools. Right? You're not, you, it's fine, you can have it, a, I mean, synthetic biologists like to use Lego a lot as, a, as a, a, an analog. So you can have your bucket of Lego and you want to build, you know, the, the Millennium Falcon, if you don't have all the parts, you're not going to, maybe, might look kind of like it, but it's not going to be what you, what you want. You need all the parts. So our job is to continue to look for the parts, and I think we're, we're pretty good at, at finding them. All right, so I um, just wanted to say a little bit about localization. So again, you can see proteomics analysis. Proteomics is awesome. I think these days it's really... Um, superior in a lot of ways to, to looking at transcriptomes. So if we take latex and then we take the rest of the stem that has been drained of all latex, we can see in our proteomics analysis that the entire pathway up to cell R is pretty much exclusively localized in the sieve elements of the phloem. And then, and then you have this transition zone between cell R and, the, and at least the Thebane synthase II isoform so the thebane synthase 1 is not at all in the latex with that secretion signal, and thebane synthase 2 is kind of split between both. And then by the time you get to the last steps, 
from converting thebane to morphine, you end up with everything more or less occurring in the, in the latex where the alkaloids accumulate. So um, we're discussing that a little bit this morning, that uh, there's probably a role for that apoplastic space, the cell wall space between those two cell types that is part of the metabolism. It's not just, it's just not a, a ride from one cell type to another. There's, there's certainly more happening um, there as well, and we're not quite, quite there yet. Okay, I wanna give you one more example, one more story before I'm done today. And it's again showing you how you can use this system, this, this synthetic biology, if you, know, you wanna to refer to it that way, as a discovery platform. It's not just a, a, an applied goal. It, it, it feeds back on itself and it provides a new way of looking at plant metabolism. So here's the problem. Again, it's work that was done um, in Christina Smolke's lab and published in 2014. And basically they were feeding a system working at the end of that pathway, right? So they've got a system where they've got um, thebane 6 odimethylase codinone reductase, and, and codeine odimethylase. So the last three steps that are able to convert thebane to morphine. And what they got, they got morphine, but they, they also got this thing called neomorphine. Neomorphine doesn't occur in the plant. I'm gonna show you what the difference is. It's represented here, but I'll show you in, in just a sec. What you, you don't want neomorphine, you want morphine. So how do you solve that problem? They weren't able to solve the problem um, with, uh, at least with the available parts. So we started looking at this enzyme codinone reductase. So, so here's, here's the difference. This shows you pretty well. The difference between neomorphine and morphine or neopene and codeine. Okay, they're, they're isomers of, of each other. And you can see that the only difference between codeine and neopene is the position of that double bond, right? It's here in neopene, not an improved drug. It's, it's over there in codeine. The same thing with neomorphine. It's, it's over here as opposed to here. Uh, the plant doesn't make these compounds. Maybe you can detect a tiny bit of neopene. Never can you detect neomorphine in the plant, or certainly we haven't, right? So you can get to uh, morphine via two, ro two roots. You can either go through uh, 6-O demethylation first, and then reduction, and then 3-O demethylation, or you can do 3-O demethylation first, and then 6-O demethylation um, second, and you, in either way, you get to, you get to morphine. Uh, this, the, the pink root or orange root over here is the major one. So we, you know, we thought, well, this step over here seems to be key, this codinone reductase. And this is, this is one of the observations that, that we found. So if we put codeine into a tube, and added codinone reductase or core and NADP plus, so it's a redox reaction, we could detect the formation of neopene just by incubating it for a few hours. But it's a reversible reaction. Theoretically, if you, you, know, if you added neopene, does it go back? And the answer is no, it doesn't go backwards. It, it will go this way, but it won't go backwards. Neopene to neomorphine, or sorry, neopene to neopenone, is, is not a reaction that is supported by the enzyme. So if neopene or neomorphine is produced from neopenone or neomorphinone, right, so redu reducing that, that double bond over there to an alcohol, these compounds become metabolically trapped. The plant isn't doing it. But if you build this pathway as it stands in yeast, the yeast do this and this equally. How do you solve that problem? So we thought, well, let's look at the, part that we, the parts we already have. And, and what seemed key in this process is this codinone reductase enzyme that is an NADPH dependent reversible oxidoreductase enzyme. There's quite a few isoforms in any, any particular uh, opium poppy plant, and they're all very similar to one another. So this is a good lesson that when you look at enzymes and you see that amount of um, sequence identity, you're probably going to say, well, they're the same. Pick one. And, and that can be dangerous because they're not actually the same. Okay, so here's, here's um, first indication that they're not the same. One of the isoforms that we call core B, which only has a few amino acid substitutions compared to these core 1.1 to 4 isoforms, is much better when it's provided with codeine and NADP plus at producing neopene than the other ones are. Much better at doing this. Right? Very, very, very much significantly a better, a better enzyme. Right? So um, when we uh, look at its substrate range, 
core, they're, they're actually very similar in terms of substrate range. Um, and you know, so they must be participating somehow in, in this reaction over here. So we thought, okay, well, how is it, what's gonna happen if we take core B as opposed to one of the other core isoforms and put it in yeast? Is, is that, are, are, we, are, are the engineers simply not using the right isoform of this enzyme? And certainly there was a difference but the difference was a quantitative difference. So here's core 1.3 that's not as good at producing neopene. And you can see it's, it's producing equally in a pathway where we feed Thebane. We've mimicked what the Smolke lab did. We put Thebane 6 od methylase, core either 1.3 or core B, and we looked for, for neopene versus codeine, or we added in the codeine od methylase, and we, we looked as well for morphine and neomorphine. And what you can see is just as they reported, relatively equal levels of either codeine and neopene or morphine and neomorphine, a lot lower levels because the CODM doesn't really work so well. Core B is doing it much better. You can see the scale is about 10 times higher, but it's preferring the formation of neopene. There's something else going on here. It didn't seem to be the isoform of core, but we still followed this, thought it was, it was worthwhile taking a look at every amino acid substitution in those isoforms and asking what do they do? So the, paper, the work's being published in Plant Journal and I'll just point out that we identified four different residues. I'm only gonna point out one in particular, it's that uh, position 25 here, and it either exists as a valine or an alanine. And that one, we're, with that one, we're able to toggle between either the superior conversion rate of core B or the inferior conversion rate of, in this case, core 1.2 or, or um, 1.4, we're able to toggle between the two of them. And we're also, we also saw that the stability of the enzyme with a single amino acid substitution is dramatically changed. So core B is much more stable using this fluorescence thermo shift assay. Um, it's much more stable, especially than core 1.2, 1.2 was so unstable that we couldn't even get a measurement. 1.3 is not, not as thermostable as, as, as core B. So you simply increase the temperature and melt the protein. And if it's more stable, it's gonna melt at a higher temperature. It's just the basis of that assay. So something in, in uh, response to even a single amino acid substitution is changing the stability of the protein and its catalytic conversion rate efficiency. So taking this into a structural realm, we uh, looked at a homology model, we modeled this after chalcone reductase, modeled the enzyme after chalcone reductase, and what the model showed us was that this either valine or alanine, that one amino acid, is interacting um, sterically with the, the cofactor, with NADP plus or NADPH. So this supports the mutagenesis work, gives us a lot of information about an, an enzyme in the pathway, but it doesn't tell us why plants don't make neopene or neomorphine. You know, but you follow your lines of inquiry. Um, we're collaborating with a structural biologist in Calgary, Ken Ng, and they've determined the, the structure based on the crystal of codonone reductase. It turns out it's a dimer. It was reported in the literature when it was first purified that it was a monomer. Right? And, and, and it's not. The structure shows us that it's a homodimer. How does that change the way that we look at the function of this enzyme? Not sure yet, but certainly, you know, dimerization is going to change a lot of the, the enzymatic features of, of, of the protein. So, you know, how does that affect engineering strategies and so on? I mean, the more you know, the easier things are going to be. Okay, so I've, I'm going to go to my last slide and just show you that we do have a solution to this. And here's, the, um, here's some data in yeast. When we add, or when we, when we use our solution, I keep it quiet because the lawyers told me to. Um, should be shortly that it'll, it'll be published, hopefully early next year. And you can see that we can do the same thing that we did with Thebane synthase. By understanding how things actually work, we can change in yeast the ratio um, of primarily neopene and very little codeine without our solution to primarily codeine and 
and virtually no neopene with it. Right? So we think this is how the plant is doing it. Certainly it's a solution from an engineering point of view and it's applicable not only to the formation of natural compounds, but also to the formation, this is hydrocodone over here as well. I'm sorry, that, I'm not sure where that guy came from. But, um, okay, so you can read about this hopefully in uh, about two months um, and find out what the solution is. But so this is the summary slide of, of basically how we approach our basic science and seamlessly more or less integrate it with the translational work and the and the uh, the commercialization aspects. So we know there's lots of missing parts still in the plant. You need the plant to find those missing parts. If you're working without plants and you're trying to engineer plant pathways, I don't think you're going to get very far. Uh, you can put things together, you can assemble them, you can use the assembly to do your synthetic biology, but then the synthetic biology feeds back. It tells us what's not working, it tells us where the bottlenecks are. And we see many more. And when we identify a bottleneck, now we have a system that we can use to find a solution. And so far, we've, we've I think, done, done quite well. Yields are going up. And, and uh, the trajectory looks, looks good in terms of um, hopefully at some point getting, getting to um, commercially relevant yields, uh, not only for this system, but you could replace this plant with anything you want. The, of course, the big one right now in Canada is cannabis. I don't even want to say the word. I'm tired of hearing about it. But, um, but anyway, that's, I'm going to stop there. And hopefully that was informative. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. There's one already. Where are the different um, metabolites and enzymes localized? And have they, is part of the uh, pathway extracellular? No. So none of the pathway is extracellular. The products have to be secreted to the medium. Um, they won't accumulate in the cell, so there's going to be no storage capability within yeast. The, the enzymes should be localized to the compartments that, you know, any signaling information on the enzyme or lack thereof is, is directing. So if they're P450s, they're membrane bound, so they're going to be on the ER in yeast. Um, if they are soluble in the plant, then plant cells, then they're going to be soluble in in, uh, in yeast as well, but ultimately the products need to be exported to the media. There's nowhere to accumulate them. Oh, so that's, I, I'm thinking of the synthetic elements and the, um, the tissues where you have sort of a piece of a protoplasmic living space and then you send it into something that's not so good. And um, at what point did the yeast kick out the um, So So that's, that's Another one of the problems that you can imagine is, is going to afflict any of these engineered systems uh, is that these, these are kind of um, xenobiotic compounds. The yeast doesn't want them. So pathway intermediates are being kicked out as well, which, you know, if you're trying to get to a specific end product, you want to keep those intermediates inside. You know, so are there metabolic channels? Do these enzymes in the plant interact with one another? Are we missing helper? proteins, components that are helping to form those channels. How does a plant deal with many of these intermediates that are very hydrophobic, not very water soluble? You know, what, to what extent are um, lipophilic parts of a plant cell involved in, in biosynthesis? These are all, these are all unknown questions, um, but questions that, you know, as I say, are emerging as, as important because there's a specific goal to, to try to achieve and, and problems to solve. So don't we don't we actually don't know all that much more than the model that I showed you. This is where these enzymes are found in two different cells in the plant, and you know somehow there's a handoff between those two cells of some intermediate. Presumably, I think the intermediate is the acetylated the seven O acetate of salutaridinol because an acetate would be much more soluble and easy to transport from one cell to another. Thebane is highly insoluble. It's very difficult to get it dissolved, even to do an assay. So I, I'm not so sure that that's a good candidate for trans, translocation. Um, how do these questions fit into the um, efforts to try to do it all in a single compartment, in a single cell? We'll see. <laughs> don't, don't, don't know yet, but it, it works. But it's not just a question of having it work. You have to have it work well enough 
above a, a threshold to produce levels that make it economically uh, competitive with simply throwing seeds in the ground and, and growing plants. Still a lot of questions we don't. Peter, I enjoyed your, your seminar. Um, Zenk, I think in a report that I read it at a conference, uh, said that morphine was found in a frog. So the question is really, has morphine been found in any other organism? And if so... In me? Well, us. <laughs> uh, <and if> so, <laughs> Apparently. Is the biosynthesis the same? So, so um, there, uh, in the last bits of research that, that he was doing, uh, that's, that was a major focus. And it was demonstrating that in human tissue that you can detect small quantities of morphine. Um, the pathway, my understanding is that the proposed pathway in mammals and, and probably other animals is chemically similar. But biochemically completely different. So there's no, you know, you can't go to the human genome and find any of these plant genes. I mean, you might find certain things that are similar, but they're not functionally the same and, and they, they don't participate in the pathway. So it's still kind of um, paradoxical in, in the sense that there seems to be pretty good evidence that we make our own morphine and maybe that's why we have a, a, such a good opiate receptor or a set of receptors but there's still not very good biochemical support that, um, I, in terms of how it's done, how it happens. One more. Have you looked into the evolutionary history and purpose of morphine within the plant itself and use this to uh, sort of give you insight on the pathway further? Um, uh, we've thought about that, yeah, for sure. Um, thought we had an idea. I mean, we were talking about this, this idea of where do enzymes come from. I mean, you have a pool of, 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 um, of genes that can be recruited into these specialized pathways. Uh, that's, certainly, that's the case. I mean, we thought we had it solved um, a few years ago. And it was actually some of the work that Scott Farrow did when he was in my lab. And it was, it was looking at the fact that these enzymes, the OD methylases, so the third to last and the last step in morphine biosynthesis, those OD methylases will actually OD methylate a wide collection of, um, of uh, benzyl isoquinoline alkaloids with very different structures than morphine and codeine. And, and what we thought was, oh, that's the function that's being selected for. And this is just a, this is a, um, not a byproduct, but a parallel thing that happens and it's, it's unimportant to the plant from a selection point of view. Um, so, so Scott actually took, um, so we thought, well, if that's the case, then we should find OD methylation activity for orthologs in plants that are related to opium poppy. And he looked at dozens of them. And, and those, those two OD methylases are the only two that showed any activity with these benzyl isoquinoline alkaloids. So it kind of threw that idea out the window, but I still kind of think that you know, we're, we're always looking at this from the point of view of well, morphine and look what it does. Look at its pharmacological activity. There must be a deliberate selection in the plant on the basis of that pharmacological property. And that, that can just be totally misleading us. It might be some other compounds where, you know, morphine is just a, you know, a happy um, circumstance of, of some other metabolism. And, and we're looking in the wrong place for the evolutionary um, connection. But there isn't a good answer to that. I mean, why does, why does one plant, and that's actually not true because, and we don't, I don't, actually I'd like to tell Health Canada this because I like to cause them fits about how terrible controlled substances regulations are. I'm sure it's the same in the US. Um, you know, we, we started looking at uh, other related plants to opium poppy that are not supposed to have morphine and about half of them do. The levels are much lower, but you know, my, what I like to tell them is that you know, a lot of plants are on the verge of being able to make morphine. It does, you know, how much, to what extent do you need substitutions in order to turn enzymes 
the key ones that are missing in other plants that don't make opiates into enzymes that can actually participate in that pathway? Probably not many, not many substitutions. So, you know, when, when I look at it that way, I think, well, this could also just be that we're in the right place at the right time. And we've also been breeding this plant for 6,000 years. So, you know, we've changed a lot. And that's actually something we see in the genome. The genome of opium poppy is a mess, just like, just like most domesticated plants. There's extensive copy number variation. There's all kinds of deleted bits and, you know, so then have you looked at any like ancient DNA of I want to. Okay. That's so, you know, if you can find a backer, we need a we need a rich person that, you know, just because that would be great. I mean, that's my that's my dream one day is connect with anthropologists and have this big international team go out and find opium poppy material, the that ancient material and just sequence it all, put it against the reference genome and see if you can trace how this plant kind of moved around throughout history. I, I, think, I think we could. Might even be a science paper or nature. Need to, I need to do the yeast thing first and get rich, and then I'll do that. I, you know, or, or take up a collection if you all want to sort of pitch in. So, uh, are there any more questions? Because we have for some time, and there's lunch for graduate students afterwards. Keep the joy and this has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.